Thanks for coming. Thanks for finding your way uh, over to here, which I understand is not the normal uh, seminar uh, location. Um, thanks for the introductions. Uh, a couple of other acknowledgments. So uh, I'm, I'm in Australia at the moment working with the Victoria Center for Climate Change Adaptation Research. So they got me at least 10,000 miles and then um, you guys have helped bring me a little bit further to get me up the, up the coast. And I also want to acknowledge um, one of my co-authors, uh, Megan Maloney at um, Oak Ridge, um, that's, that's helped me with some of the analysis um, and some of the papers that I'm gonna, gonna talk about. Um, okay, so overcoming path dependence, I don't really know how to do that, but apparently it was a good hook to get you um, in the room. Um, but I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a concept that I'm playing with um, because a lot of my research is, focuses on either sort of understanding vulnerability, societal vulnerability to climate change, or looking at adaptation and the challenges to adapting to climate change. And the path dependence concept or the issue is one that I think kind of unites um, those two different uh, sort of uh, bodies of, of work. And hopefully that'll become clear over time. So my outline, I'm gonna talk a bit about path dependence as an adaptation um, constraint. Um, I wanna present some of the work we've been publishing recently, which is effectively could be considered ways of, of metrics for uh, demonstrating or quantifying path dependence or its effects in terms of consequences of climate change. And then I've got a couple of slides about overcoming path dependence, which is really audience participation um, because it's sort of some slides I developed last week, um, stuff I'm thinking about, but um, certainly don't have any, have any real answers. So I'm um, throw some ideas out there and, and will hopefully attract feedback or ridicule. Okay, so path dependence as an adaptation constraint. So at the moment, and apologies, this is a bit US centric, um, but we have sort of two narratives going on around adaptation in the research and practice community. So one narrative is there's so much activity going on around adaptation around the world. So if we look at US examples on the left-hand side, um, different reports coming out from federal US agencies talking about the consequences of climate change for their mission and the need to think about it and adapt. So top, going top to bottom, uh, Department of Defense, concern about climate change, impacts on national security, international migration. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, that's Homeland Security was the top one. The second one, Department of Defense, which does a a review of sort of defense strategy every few years, and the last time around, climate change sort of featured prominently. Uh, in the bottom left is USAID, which of course is looking at climate change in the context of, of development and concerned that climate change might affect um, development gains and its mission in supporting uh, economic development around the world. Um, we're also seeing a lot of activity on the private sector, so many of us are familiar with like the reinsurance industry, which is a, a common example of a private sector entity that's thinking about adaptation. So the top right report is one from Swiss Re, looking at climate risk to urban areas. Um, but some other interesting things coming up. So I think it was last year, Monsanto Corporation, which is often in the news for any number of reasons, um, purchased uh, a private company called the Climate Corporation, which is essentially a private sector provider of climate and weather information. So they paid a billion dollars for a private sector entity to enhance their understanding and capacity and access to information about climate and weather, presumably to support the agricultural sector. And then the bottom right is uh, a report that basically talks about the adaptation services industry, um, projections that it's going to grow to a billion dollar industry just in the United States um, by next year. Um, with, it predicts, exponential growth after that. Um, so adaptation is hot, it's everywhere, and everybody's starting to do it. So that's one narrative. Another narrative is, oh, it turns out this is actually really, really hard. So as you may be aware, IPCC Working Group 2 report is coming out uh, later this month. I cannot show you any information from that report, but this is a Wordle diagram from our chapter which focuses on uh, climate change adaptation opportunities, constraints, and limits. Uh, and some key 
terms that come out of that are obviously constraints, limits, opportunities, capacity, um, development. Um, so there's this whole merging, not growing, body of knowledge around, hey, this isn't as easy as everybody sort of thought it would be you know, 10 years ago or so when everybody was focused on um, mitigation. And so what we have is a situation where traditionally we talked about adaptation um, from what some have called the, the first best world perspective or the optimal perspective. Um, if we anticipate future climate change um, and implement responses in a very efficient and optimal way, um, there's this big solution space, there's a lot of opportunity, flexibility to avoid risk. But the reality is more what some have termed the, a second best world, where that adaptation solution space, that's potential space, is actually reduced by the realities of climate change, public policy, um, society, and values. So um, we're dealing with a much more constrained body of options, uh, and as we're seeing here in Australia and elsewhere, it's not really a straightforward path to, to adapt to, to future risk. So there's a whole body of literature now that talks about specific types of constraints. Um, Moser and Ekstrom uh, did a nice paper on this in PNAS a few years ago. And Beesbrook uh, last year published a paper that reviewed all the literature that you know, was identified on adaptation constraints and sort of classified them into how many papers talk about institutional constraints, social constraints, financial constraints. And this is the way that constraints are often talked about. You know, so the classic one that's big for international climate policy is the financial constraints issue. So how do you finance the big demand for adaptation in the developing world? So the challenge with this is this sort of treats this issue of adaptation constraints um, sort of like you know, indicators of adaptive capacity. So the little figure there is you either aren't constrained, in which case you can go and do the optimal, um, pursue the optimal solution, or you're constrained and you're unhappy. And so all we have to do, right, is just give people more money, fix their institutions up, change societal values, and, and off we go. Um, and so that seems a bit of an oversimplification, right? Um, and uh, uh, Petra Checkert's work, um, she, one of their recent papers, she talked about, yeah, it's nice to talk about vulnerability, adaptive capacity, these sort of proximal indicators, but we really want to get into the more fundamental issues which are the sort of social institutional processes that create these constraints in the first place. So the idea being is, okay, if we don't have the financial resources to adapt, there's underlying processes that create poverty. There's underlying processes that create societal or cultural values. There are underlying processes that drive access to technology. Um, so we want to get at some of these more fundamental um, issues when we want to start thinking about how do we actually change behavior um, and, and implement solutions. So in that context, um, I see path dependence as, or I've argued that this is one of those really fundamental societal institutional processes that's giving rise to a lot of these constraints. So whether you're talking about institutional issues, finance issues, technology, um, there's a much broader uh, challenge associated with, or path dependence that's giving rise to those, to those issues. So, we sort of presented that definition at the top in a paper in Global Environmental Change last year, and the idea is simply that um, the dependence of future societal decision processes and or outcomes with respect to adaptation is sort of constrained or influenced by what we've done in the past or what's, what's happened in the past. Um, and we argued in a, in a later paper in the year that this is one of these key driving forces. So that's kind of a generic definition. When you get into the path dependence literature, a lot of it comes out of the economics literature, um, you get a lot more nuanced and sophisticated discussions of what path dependence really is. Um, that table from an from, uh, uh, article by Page presents some specific types and examples. Um, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but you know, the classic one we talk about in adaptation is lock-in. So the idea, particularly around infrastructure, you know, you build a big infrastructure like a desalination plant or a seawall in order to adapt to sea level rise or water resource, um, uh, challenges to water resource reliability. And then you have that infrastructure and you're stuck with it. And then as a result, that drives all your decision making going forward. 
And some people have argued that leads to maladaptation, makes you less flexible to future surprises and, and, and changes. Um, but there's a whole variety of, of other things, issues like self-reinforcement, which is the idea that we, we implement decisions and then build large institutions to support those decisions, which again, therefore, perpetuates a certain type of behavior. So um, one area that the US gets criticized for is essentially the prison system and the way we incarcerate large numbers of individuals um, for petty drug offenses. But once you decide that you're gonna put people in prison, well, you have to develop you know, an institution of, of courts in order to try people. You have to build infrastructure in terms of, of prisons to house people. And once you have that, you're not likely to go, hey, let's, uh, let's empty out the prisons and, and change our policies because there's a lot of financial lock-in, societal expectations around these institutions and how they're going to function. Okay, so an example that, that appears in literature that, that sort of goes through the history of agricultural development in, in the US, and this comes from uh, Gary Libcap's paper from I think 2010 or, or 11. So this is a map of, of the sort of distribution of rainfall in the United States circa late 19th century, so 1870s, 1880s. Um, the lighter area in the western part of the country is, is the arid west, which extends from essentially Mexico all the way up to Canada. So in the late 19th century, um, we started to see you know, the frontier of American development expanding into this, into this region. And initially what they did in terms of agricultural policy was say, well, we're just gonna continue the policies that have worked for us in the past. So previously they expanded it in the Midwest. Um, and they said, you know, what worked there is allocating small farm plots that allowed you know, regular folks to come in um, take up, uh, you know, acquire land, start small farms, um, and that was a way of encouraging people to come and settle and start agricultural production. And the other concept was one that the rain follows the plow. So this is a scientific principle that where you have agriculture that contributes to additional rainfall, um, which we now know to be completely erroneous, but that was the idea at the time. So already we're starting to see path dependence emerging in terms of people applying concepts and policies that worked previously, they have applied previously in other locations, even though the context is quite different. So initially, that proved somewhat disastrous. Hard to make a living in an arid environment with a small plot. So the solution that was eventually brought was one of irrigation. So much like the story of the Murray Darling Basin, they started handing out um, rights to uh, water for irrigation based upon a fixed allocation. Um, and a lot of this became institutionalized in what are called water management districts, so a regional body that sort of controls the allocation of water for a particular agricultural region. So we're seeing the institutionalization of this sort of irrigation uh, solution. So as we move into the 20th century, this started to prove problematic. One, it's an arid region. So how do you guarantee people fixed allocation uh, every year? Um, as we know, climate trends started to emerge uh, during the latter half of the 20th century. And the big issue was urbanization, um, where the demand for water in urban areas um, became so large that you started seeing the price for water in urban areas being several orders of magnitude larger than in agricultural areas. But you have these water management districts which are sort of locking up water, preventing the free trade or exchange of water at market value, um, and that reduces the flexibility. And so multiple decades were invested in how do we reconcile these competing demands for water among these different users. So this whole system, which was essentially set up in the latter half of the 19th century, sort of perpetuates today in terms of creating problems in terms of reconciling, resolving water competition and governance issues in the arid west. And the classic story of you have vested interest, and of course agriculturalists have vested interest in having access to water. Water management districts, those institutions have a vested interest in perpetuating themselves. And changing all of those institutional structures is uncertain about who benefits and who loses, and therefore it's better just to not do anything, right? So a common story that we hear uh, in many other different contexts related to adaptation. Okay, so that's sort of the framing of, of, of the path dependence um, issue. 
Um, and a lot of that focuses on institutional path dependence. Um, I've been looking at it from um, a slightly different uh, context and thinking about path dependence and what does it mean for the exposure of society, population, infrastructure, assets to extreme weather events uh, as well as, as climate change. So um, this next bit will be sort of showing how some of this stuff plays out in terms of consequences of extreme weather. So what we've been doing is sort of arguing that disaster losses in the United States in particular are an indicator of, of societal path dependence and its adverse consequences. So we know from the IPCC SREX reports, one of the big conclusions was that um, increasing exposure of people and their assets to extreme weather events um, was basically the big driver of long-term upward trends in economic losses. So it's not a climate change signal, it's essentially a development signal. Um, so the two figures there, um, the top one shows the sort of trend in global disaster losses, insured and uninsured, point being there's a nice, it's a variable trend, but an, an upward trend that's nonlinear. And the bottom is uh, a similar type of plot just based upon US disaster loss statistics, so similar um, upward trend. So why is this sort of a useful indicator? Well, we know that the major cause of disasters globally is extreme weather events. Um, so there's a link to climate. Um, we also know that because of these kinds of data, disaster losses track socioeconomic trends and, and phenomena, particularly demography, population growth, um, economic development. Um, historical data aren't that great. Surprisingly, um, even though we know that these are major sources of loss of life and loss of, of, of economic activity and assets, particularly in the public domain, we do a pretty lousy job of keeping track of where these losses um, occur. But um, uh, so part of the challenge in doing this work is managing that. Um, we also know that disaster risk management, hazard mitigation has a long history in, in, in public policy. So that's sort of why we think this is a useful um, sort of thing to work with. Now, I'm thinking about, so this is another figure from the IPCC's XREX report, which is sort of conceptual model for um, disaster risk or sort of climate risk um, in general. And path dependence sort of influences all of these. Um, so we know we have path dependence in weather events and climate change. That's the anthropogenic uh, climate change signal. That's the commitment to future climate change associated with the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we have path dependence and vulnerability. Ideally, we would like that to be a, a good story. We become less vulnerable over time through economic development that reduces our sensitivity to extreme weather events. And there's evidence that that, that is the case, but not always the case. Um, and then there's the issue of, of exposure. And the, the plots I just showed you illustrate how increasing exposure to extreme weather events um, and that long-term trajectory of rising exposure and losses um, is also a, a manifestation of, of path dependence. Now, among those, um, I've sort of explicitly concentrated on that exposure element. Um, and particularly in my interest is illustrating how if you're concerned about climate change and its adverse impacts at some point in the future, um, you also need to think about how societal processes, including economic development and population growth, put more and more assets in harm's way um, that therefore drive up impacts independent of climate change, but of course we need to consider climate risk um, as well. So effectively what we've been trying to do is um, quantify some of this um, and quantify it at some spatially disaggregated scales. And so we've been working with a very simple um, model to try and, and do this. Um, so the idea, and, and we published this last year, is um, going sort of left to right across that equation. If we're interested in the future economic loss associated with a particular natural hazard, call it a hurricane, tropical cyclone, whatever, um, that future economic loss is a function of the current loss, uh, what we experience in the present day, times um, the increase or the change in exposure to that particular type of hazards. That's effectively the sort of societal development, which is a function of both 
increasing population and economic growth and, and wealth accumulation. So it's mainly those two terms. And then the X term at the end there is the exposure elasticity. And I'll explain that a bit more in the end, but effectively what this is is how much do losses change as you increase the exposure? Um, and I'll come back to that if you're scratching your head. Point being is, so we've been playing around and, and parameterizing this model and applying this kind of model um, at sort of two different scales. So one, we've done this for the whole United States um, at the sort of local government level um, for about five different types of extreme weather events, um, basically using sort of, well, I'll explain the indicators in, in a minute. Um, and then we've also been focusing just on the coastal zone. Um, particularly the coastal zone of the eastern United States from effectively Texas all the way up down around Florida and up the east coast all the way up into to Maine. Um, and here we're using a much more refined analysis um, where we're looking at these processes, um, trying to do it sort of at scale, so using high resolution um, hazard and uh, socioeconomic information um, to really look at this at a much more refined level. Um, and a lot of this work is, is, was either published last year or some of it was published, uh, well, is in, is, is just came out um, a couple days ago. So I want to start talking about this exposure elasticity. So there's this, the assumption embodied in all of this is as you increase exposure, losses go up. Okay? That seems pretty straightforward. Um, but can you quantify that? And that's the big challenge. So there's two assumptions that are in the literature. So one we call the, the simple assumption, and this is that economic losses scale in direct proportion to increases in exposure. So the idea being um, if you triple the number of houses in a floodplain and you get a flood, then you get three times the, the number of, of damages. So pretty straightforward, intuitively simple, and it's, this has been used in like Roger Pilkey Jr.'s um, work um, from say five to 10 years ago. The other assumption we call the observed assumption, and this is an attempt to actually quantify this elasticity with data. Um, and, what, and the idea is that, well, actually, economic losses increase more slowly than exposure. So just because you get a threefold increase in your exposure doesn't necessarily mean um, that you get a threefold increase in losses. Uh, there's a couple of papers that have documented this um, using. Uh, national scale data. So you take a cross section of countries, look at disaster losses and population density from those countries, um, and, and calculate that, that value. Fairly coarse level working at national scale data. So what we've been trying to do is look at this with much more um, uh, finer scale data in the United States. So some of the work we've done trying to quantify this elasticity. So what we have here is, is actual data. What we did was we, we pulled out um, preliminary damage assessments from natural disasters in the United States. So what is a preliminary damage assessment? So when you have a tornado, a hurricane, a big event, um, local government and state governments get together, they go out and they say, um, this is the amount of damage that public assets uh, experienced as a result of this event. That gets sent up to the federal government, Federal Emergency Management Agency. They look at um, those losses and as a per, as a, on a per capita basis, and they say, okay, that's over a certain threshold. You qualify for federal disaster assistance, and federal monies flow into those areas. So it's a very important part of the sort of disaster response in the United States. So we went and looked at like five years of data. So. I know it was dozens and dozens of, of events, and we have county level information on what the damage estimate was. So we can estimate on a per capita basis or a whole county basis what the losses were. And we plot that versus um, the level of exposure in that county, which is a, basically a function of the number of people and the sort of per capita income as an indicator of, of wealth. So basically comparing losses versus sort of an economic indicator for that particular county. Um, so we do that, we've got about 3,000 uh, data points there, and uh, you see this sort of um, very noisy relationship, but you see a relationship between as you move to higher and higher levels 
of exposure, you tend to get higher and higher losses. So we're basically validating our hypothesis that this is true. Um, and the scales there are actually log scales. So it's not a, a, a clear linear response. It's actually sort of a power relationship um, for those of you who are into that kind of thing. Um, but what it actually means is based upon data, so this would be our observed elasticity, um, losses do indeed grow more slowly than uh, exposure and quite significantly. What we also, that's sort of a whole bunch of different types of hazards grouped together. We've also broken those down. So across the bottom, we have the data just for floods, just for storms. These are sort of thunderstorms, hurricanes, and wildfires. Um, and if we take those sort of, uh, those curves and sort of plot out idealistic ones, we can sort of compare across different types of hazards how losses should scale. And it does tend to, to vary. So based upon these type of data, what we see is that floods are particularly, uh, or losses associated with floods tend to scale with um, economic with exposure um, at a higher level than losses associated with, with wildfires, for example. Um, and this actually makes some intuitive sense. So if you think about wildfires, they tend to occur in areas where you have relatively low population densities, right? Once you get a sort of a certain level of development, you stop worrying about wildfires because urban areas tend to not be affected by them. Um, so therefore, you get a relatively weak relationship um, with uh, wildfires in terms of increasing exposure. Um, but you think about floods, which do indeed occur in urban areas um, all the time. That's when we're particularly concerned about them. You get a much closer um, scaling. So this allows us to, one, validate this hypothesis. It allows us to say quantify um, what that elasticity is, um, which means if we know something about how exposure changes over time, we can use these relationships to make some first order estimates of how losses should scale over time as well. So that brings us back to our equation. So that's the, the X component. Um, now we can talk about different ways of quantifying the exposure component. So again, we've done this at a couple of different scales. So for the United States, for the, for the entire country, again, we're working at the local government level, and we generated this very simple metric which we called potential socioeconomic exposure. So this is the idea of this is what would be exposed if you were to experience a natural disaster of some type. And all it really is is a simple ratio. So the uh, potential socioeconomic exposure um, at any given point in time is a function of the population times per capita wealth. So it's basically purely an economic measure. Uh, the change in exposure over time is therefore future population to current population times future wealth to current wealth. So it's very easy to calculate uh, uh, this stuff using an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so where the data come from, Obviously, we have historical data for county population for the whole United States going back to 1960 or so. Um, so we're using data from um, uh, 1960 to 1980, where we have sort of decadal census. And then after that, we have even more frequent estimates of, of population growth. Um, and then going into the future, which for us started in 2009, we were doing this work, we basically just use a demographic model. So for every county, we're modeling birth rates, death rates, um, international migration, domestic migration, using that to generate um, population estimates. So it's essentially a scenario of future population. So for our economic indicator, we've used a couple of different ones. Um, one per capita income, another is per capita earnings. Um, they give slightly different indications of future rates of growth in wealth, effectively. So we've done our analysis with both, sort of trying to account for uncertainty in these, in these metrics. I think what I'm going to show you is just from the per capita income. Um, and then going into the future, we just extrapolate for every county. Every county has, based upon the past 10 years or so of data, uh, a specific unique rate of, of growth. So we're assuming that counties continue to grow into the future economically the way they have in the past. Now, that's wrong. Right, not going to happen. Any number of ways of demonstrating that. Um, one being, if you look at North Dakota, 
which has boomed in the past few years because of fracking and oil and gas exploration. Its population is shot up, its economic development is shot up. Um, but we can't anticipate those kinds of things other than to acknowledge this is a scenario and you know, the reality is not gonna play out this way. Okay, so when you map this stuff out, what does it look like? So that figure on, so these are basically past changes in this measure of exposure. So on the left-hand side, all the way on the left, that's our change in population at the county level from 1960 to 2009. So the blue areas are where you've had faster rates of growth in population um, or bigger net change. And um, the sort of brown areas around the arid west <laughs> Um, are where you've had much slower rates of growth or even out-migration um, into urban areas. So you see the big areas of growth have been in the southwest and the southeast, particularly Florida. Um, and this is a function of economic development, air conditioning in particular, and lots of irrigation and golf courses in the southwest for retirees. The two plots in the middle are how wealth has changed. Um, from 1960 to 2009, again, the top is per capita income, the bottom is per capita earnings. So the blue areas are faster rates of growth. So per capita income gives you a faster rate of change in wealth than our other indicator. Um, but again, what do you see? Big changes, particularly in, in the Southeast. So that's been the big area of, of growth in recent decades, um, even though on an absolute level, you've got more assets obviously concentrated in the north, in the urban northeast. But you also see the sort of the uh, north central United States has been a big area of growth as well, and that's effectively really rapid growth in the past several years due to oil and gas exploration in a lot of those areas, as well as movie stars buying ranches in Montana and stuff like that. Okay, so you, you basically multiply those together and you get this sort of map of, of socioeconomic exposure um, around the United States. So the top one would be if you do population times per capita income, the bottom is population times per capita earnings. Similar story, rise of the Southwest, rise of the Southeast, um, particularly more rapid growth in urban areas. I'm from Atlanta, which is that big red blob in the sort of, in Georgia in the, in the sort of bottom right which has grown from a million people in the you know, 1970s to six million or so people um, today. Um, the other thing that you see is a lot, a consistent pattern of rapid growth around the coastal zone. Uh, basically from Texas all the way through Florida and effectively all the way up the East Coast. Okay. Um, much like what we've seen historically in Australia, I would imagine, what we see right now in this particular region of, of Southeast Queensland. Um, so we've done additional work with these data in terms of projecting future losses associated with, with natural hazards driven by these scenarios. Um, but to show some of that, I want to I wanna switch gears, I believe. OK, sorry. Got ahead of myself. Um, Backing up, so that was the historical information. So this is essentially what it looks like if you project this into the future using our, our growth scenarios. So overall, we get about a three to four fold increase in exposure as we've defined it across the United States, much higher in urban areas, coastal zones, uh, or certain, certain areas. Um, and effectively, you see no change in, in, in other areas. Um, and there's this whole issue around, well, if we have areas that aren't adding people and aren't growing economically, that suggests there's some issues there as well in terms of are these viable communities, what's happening there. Um, and there is a lot of case to be made that where you don't see economic development and population growth, um, you actually have uh, communities that are struggling um, economically. Uh, particularly the lower Mississippi River Valley is, is a classic example of that. So you can use this indicators to also identify where you have um, uh, significant social problems related to economic activity, and one could argue re increased vulnerability, reduced capacity to manage extreme weather events and, and climate change. Um, but because a lot of this is, assumes that things in the future continue as they have in the recent past, the overall pattern looks quite similar to um, what we saw before, and these data go out to, to 2050. 
Okay, so I think I can ready to move on. Okay, so the key story there is this interesting one around what's happening in the coastal zone, right? So that's an area where we see this is particularly problematic and it's been punctuated by Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Ike, Hurricane Gustav, and on down the board in terms of relatively recent big events that had massive losses um, uh, in areas that have grown rapidly over the past several decades. So we've been trying to look at this at a much higher resolution. Um, and what we've been doing is triangulating or putting together three bits of information. So one, we've been using a, a storm surge model of intermediate complexity um, developed by NOAA, which is a sort of storm surge model used for disaster risk management, uh, particularly for municipal governments. So it's a model they use to, to plot evacuation areas for hurricanes, for example. So we're using that model. We compare it with high resolution elevation information um, and generate hazard overlays for the entire eastern United States coastline for category one, two, three, four, five tropical cyclones. And we also um, add in uh, sea level rise based upon IPCC scenarios to account for that additional risk from uh, sea level rise. And this is stuff we just um, published. So we've got these hazard layers that tell us at relatively high resolution with big uncertainties, um, which areas are potentially susceptible to inundation from different types of storms. The next thing, instead of looking at population, um, we're looking at housing as an indicator of sort of societal exposure. Uh, and we're able to do this because of um, some data that were developed with, through funding from the US EPA, um, which generated a set of um, high resolution housing scenarios for the entire United States from basically now to the end of the century. And this is basically one hectare resolution um, gridded data. In every grid cell, you get an estimate of the density of housing units in that grid cell. Um, so that gives us some indication of you know, rates of growth in terms of population, demography, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then the last point, again, is, well, we also want to know, you know what's happening with wealth accumulation, how is economic activity growing over time. And for that, we're using GDP scenarios. Um, we're using the national GDP scenarios from the Special Report on Emission Scenarios from the IPCC, which is now 15 years old. Um, we're adjusting those based upon, we're doing, applying local adjustments so the, uh, to individual um, counties, so instead of getting one rate of GDP growth for the whole United States, um, we get different rates of growth based upon how counties have historically grown with respect to um, GDP. So we get some spatial disaggregation there. Now, if you're familiar with the SRS scenarios, you'll go, man, that's really old, right? That's from 2000, work on it started in the 1990s. Um, we've moved on to other types of scenarios since then. But what works is the GDP scenarios are based upon those estres scenarios. Our sea level rise scenarios are based upon those estres scenarios. The housing data, those scenarios, also based upon the estres scenarios. So across these three different types of information, you have a consistent body of socioeconomic assumptions that are being projected into the future. Um, and I think that's nice, and this is one of the few ways I think we can actually do that kind of, um, kind of integration and maintain internal consistency in, in, in assumptions. So some examples of what this looks like. Um, it's a bit washed out, but to give you an idea. Um, so these are all plots from the Hampton Roads area of Virginia in the east coast of the United States. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, no worries. Suffice to say, this is an area that's been identified as particularly vulnerable to coastal hazards. Um, it's certainly in sort of Hurricane Alley for the East Coast. Um, and there's a lot of areas in this region that experience routine flooding from regular old storm surge, storm surge events um, in the present day. So the top left plot is just uh, the current map of housing density in that particular region. So the brown areas tend to be areas with higher levels of density. Um, the sort of greenish areas are those at lower levels. 
and then some places there's effectively no housing development whatsoever. So that's sort of what those data look like. Um, the top right is our, some of our hazard information. So the, oh, okay, what is it? Yeah, so the, uh, the, uh, cat, the, the sort of whitish areas are the storm surge you would expect from a current category one event. Um, the lighter blue is the additional, is the storm surge associated with a category three event, so the additional storm surge. And the dark blue is a category three plus consideration for sea level rise, so you get additional areas that are inundated from sea level rise, but it's fairly, fairly marginal. The bottom left, so what we've done is essentially intersect those. So we take those areas that we think might be inundated, we take, we overlay that with our housing density information and we can look at housing density in areas that are exposed to inundation. Um, so it's kind of a cookie cutter kind of thing. And so the bottom left is housing density um, in areas exposed to category one events. So the red areas are now Mores of greater density in exposed areas. And the bottom right is projecting all this in the future. So we have housing density in 2100, a category three event, and a consideration for sea level rise. And so the, the, the area of housing affected expands quite markedly. At the same time, the density of housing in that area is going up at the same time. And I see people laughing because I've bombarded them with too much information, but We'll show you other plots and it'll hopefully become more simplified. Anyway, so it's all a big GIS exercise to sort of look at all these things in conjunction going into the future. Okay, so we can look at, use that to look at trends over time. So the top figure, what we've done is take all of our categories of storms, category one, two, three, four, five. So we take results across those and average them together. Okay, so this is just a general response to um, hurricane inundation. Each of the um, lines represents one of those socioeconomic scenarios. So we've got an A1, an A2, if you're familiar with that lingo, great. Bottom line is different trajectories of socioeconomic development. Um, and effectively what we're plotting is the exposure multiplier. So exposure grows by a factor of what over time? So if we look just at housing exposure for all areas in coastal, eastern coastal United States, what we see is by the end of the century, um, housing exposure, the number of housing units that are in these vulnerable areas basically doubles. Not a lot. There's a lot of spatial heterogeneity. Some areas it goes much higher, other areas much lower. If you translated this into number, absolute number of housing units, it's in like the millions. So it's still a pretty big, um, it's a pretty big shift. And um, essentially, you get sort of similar results regardless of what socioeconomic scenario you're using. Okay. Um, so the range of uncertainty across those um, is relatively similar. Um, that highest one in 2100 is the A1 scenario, that just is, or A2 scenario. That assumes the higher, highest amount of population growth, therefore the highest increase in, in housing density. So that's, that's one component of exposure is just how many housing units we have. The other component is, well, what's the sort of relative value of those housing units, which is a function of changes in the economy and economic growth over time. And that's the bottom left figure. And there you get a much different story. So again, we still have our different scenarios. We get a much broader range of outcomes by the end of the century. Um, and the change is anywhere from a you know, factor of four or five for our lowest economic growth scenario to a factor of 10 for our highest economic growth scenario. So you can think of this as housing values increase by a factor of four to 10 by, by the end of the century. Many of you would be quite happy to hear that the value of your house isn't gonna increase by a factor of 10. But, um, so then we put those two things together. So we look at economic growth, as well as housing, so the multiple of those, we get that bigger plot on the right, which again shows exposure in coastal areas to hurricane storm surge increases um, by a factor of like nine to 20 by the end of the, end of the century, three to five by mid-century. 
accounting for storm surge associated with tropical cyclones, sea level rise, economic growth, and increases in housing development. Okay. Nice, right? Ever seen anything like that before? Okay, you're not impressed. Okay, that's fine. Um, so, okay, so what, what's the take home message from this? Well, that, you know, these kind, so exposure scales with um, economic development and demographic change, and it scales in big ways, particularly over longer time scales. Um, there are big uncertainties associated, largely, though, the big uncertainty is around rates of economic growth, uh, which seems to be the big factor driving um, uh, this big increase um, in exposure. Um, you could call the lowest economic growth scenario the best case scenario, but if you went to most people on the street and said, well, under a best case scenario of low economic development, your exposure only increases by a factor of five or something like that, um, most people wouldn't call that a best case scenario. So the best case scenario is rapid economic growth in coastal areas. Everybody gets a big house on the beach, um, but then your exposure goes through the roof. Right. Okay, so from here what we're trying to do is say, okay, well that's just the exposure component, right? Let's go back to this issue of the elasticities. What does this mean in terms of um, actual economic losses? So to do that, we need an estimate of the current level of hurricane losses in the United States. We calculated that last year in our 2013 publication at around $5 billion. Uh, direct losses, conservative estimate. You can argue about that. You know, Hurricane Sandy alone was, you know, or several factor times uh, greater than that. Um, but so that's the estimate that, that we generated from the data we had. Um, and so if we use this simple elasticity, which assumes that loss of scale in direct proportion to exposure, then what we get is those losses of $5 billion grow by mid-century to 15 to 25 billion by mid-century and grow up to anywhere from 45 to um, 100 billion plus um, by the end of the century, so a 20-fold increase, again, um, in economic losses. Interestingly, if we use the observed elasticity, we get a much different story. So we take the hurricane elasticity, we apply it to these same data, and here we get much lower rates of, of increases in, in, in losses. So by the end of the century, somewhere between 14 and 22 billion, um, so a much smaller uh, increase. Which of those is right? I don't know. But it's a huge difference. So that elast exposure elasticity is a huge uncertainty on effectively rates of future losses and ultimately um, is a huge factor influencing how we think about path dependence. Now, in peer review, what a reviewer told me is doesn't matter that these losses are growing as long as they keep up with or match the rate of economic growth, right? So if losses increase by a factor of 10, but the economy's bigger by a factor of 10, no worries, that's economic efficiency. Um, we don't have to worry about it, right? We shouldn't invest more because then we'd be inserting inefficiencies into the market. If you take an equity-based approach, or you think about the sort of long-term ramifications of events like Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, or the fact that you've got tens of thousands of people in New York and New Jersey that still haven't found a home after Hurricane Sandy, um, you might arrive at a different conclusion about whether or not these kinds of scalings are important or not. Okay, so that's, the work we've been doing trying to sort of quantify this, and really it's an, an illustrative example that I use to point to all those folks doing vulnerability assessment and adaptation planning that say, give me some climate projections because that's what matters when thinking about future risk and vulnerability. I would argue maybe not so much. So the last bit um, is around Okay, if this is all an indication of, of path dependence, technological change that makes it capable of people to 
settle comfortably in, in Florida despite the heat and the humidity. Um, societal and cultural values around coastal amenity and everybody's desire to live there. Um, economic structure of economy which says yes you can retire and you're relatively wealthy so you can buy a, a home in a, in a coastal area. Um, and any number of policy and institutional incentives would say yeah it's okay to develop in a coastal area and spread your risk um, throughout the entire population in the United States. Um, so how do we deal with that from an adaptation perspective? Again, don't really know. Um, but suffice to say that adaptation planning, so thinking about your risk, coming up with a set of options for dealing with those risks, is not sufficient to address these much larger underlying issues. Similarly, talking about an adaptation pathway where we're going to implement some policy of managed retreat in the coastal zone and won't that be lovely and people will accept that and, and watch their investment disappear into the surf, um, probably a bit, bit naive as well. Okay, so why is that? Well, because most regions, sectors, actors, anybody you think about is already on some kind of pathway and that pathway is shaped by the current constraints that they encounter as a decision maker. So if you're in local government, it might be the constraint placed on staff by the elected counselors. It might be the fact that state government comes in and overrides any decision you make about changing your planning policy for the coastal zone. So you're already on a path which for you is adaptive based upon your particular circumstances. So we're talking about taking people off of this pathway, putting them onto another one, that's inherently difficult. What do we see happening? In adaptation right now, people are adapting within their current path. So within their existing constraints, they're avoiding large scale investments, um, and they're particularly trying to avoid trade-offs. Like we're gonna sacrifice your property value in order to make sure that council doesn't have to continue to come out and protect your property during an extreme event. That's a big trade-off, politically, economically, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody wants to make those. Um, which means everybody's continuing along the path they're already on. So what do you have to do to drive people off of that path, to realize there's another path that they could take, might want to take, might be beneficial? Any ideas? I don't really have a lot other than the detailed analysis I've done since last Friday um, in thinking about this on airplanes and such. Um, there's various, various different ways this can happen, right? So one, I think you have to have some kind of agency, meaning the people who have the p potential to change the pathway have to be in a position to affect change. So they have to have decision-making power and a willingness to do so. Okay, so that's the agency component. What else do you need? Um, so that's first and foremost. Um, and uh, other things that can, can happen, opportunities. So people recognize big opportunities and say, hey, that's great, let's go down that road. Um, a crisis might be good for driving large-scale change um, or what we call ethical um, consensus if such a thing exists. So do we see examples of this? Yeah, I think we do. There's any number of examples of technologies that have caused widespread transformational change, transitions um, in society uh, because they were viewed as opportunistic. Vaccination was one for a long time. We seem to have kind of gotten away from that um, in some areas, but certainly computing, digital technology, um, smartphones, mobile communications, et cetera, et cetera. Um, drones, really been a transformational force. Starting to see them move into non-military uses. Um, so there's some controversy about is that a path we really want to go down? But no doubt we've gone down a different path as a result of, of these because somebody in a position of agency decided there was a lot of opportunity and benefit associated with these um, technologies. Crisis, well we have a lot of those. Um, you could say the Apollo program which put man on the moon. Is that a new pathway? I don't know, but it's pretty interesting, emerged from somebody's articulation of a crisis, which was communism and Sputnik, et cetera, et cetera, and we have to put a man on the moon in order to head that off. 
seems kind of interesting or ridiculous in, in hindsight. Um, the global financial crisis, that's a crisis. Has it changed anything? Not so much. Why? Because the people in a position of agency to put us onto a different pathway didn't have an interest in doing so. Um, ethical consensus. So this is something that um, we've been discussing this at the University of the Sunshine Coast. Um, seems to be an area where it seems to have the most staying power in terms of delivering changes and in, in pathways in societal um, change. I mean, I grew up in segregated southeast of the United States. Um, and uh, I can certainly say, you know, the life I had in the southeast of the United States is much different than, say, um, the generation that came before me. Um, we're seeing what I would call very rapid changes in LGBT rights in, in America. Um, but still, that's a multi-decadal process. Um, so these are things that sort of emerge over time as sort of social imperatives. But then you can look at something like torture, which we had very strong consensus about that for a long time. And then 9-11 happened, and all of a sudden, some people in position of agency decided, no, nah, this is actually maybe something we want to, a path we want to go back down. And now you're seeing pushback um, against that um, once again. So what can we learn from this? Well, so these kinds of transitions happen. We can look for any number of examples and say, look, we make large-scale societal changes over time, and we see evidence of that, which should encourage us that we can really adapt to reduce risk and, and tackle these issues. At the same time, these kinds of changes can be highly, highly disruptive, and, and therein lies perhaps the problem. So digital technology, the internet, et cetera, et cetera, drones, these are emerging technologies that cause large-scale changes. Some perceive them as beneficial, but there's no doubt that these are very disruptive technologies. You know, 10 years ago, we weren't worrying about people having smash-ups on the highway because they were texting, right? Uh, if you were Kodak and your business revolved around making film for photography, um, you would have found digital cameras to be a fairly disruptive technology to your, to your business plan. These things can also be unstable. So for example, uh, due to like negative feedbacks. So the war on terror, yada yada, yada Snowden, NSA, all right, we had a crisis, put us on a path, uh-oh, found out about what that path actually is. Now you see a backlash against that particular pathway. Um, and the same with, with a lot of these other things where it doesn't really matter, pick anything on this map, you can probably find somebody who says, Ooh, I'm not really comfortable with that. I don't like that. Um, so there's issue of what is a real consensus and is there a real consensus around any of these things? And then the outcomes are unpredictable. And I think the Arab Spring is a good example of that. I'm calling that a social transformation, big social transition, spread of democracy hasn't been particularly smooth. And in some areas you might say we've gone backwards on the path we were on as opposed to changing paths or, or going forward. Uh, and one could argue that what we're seeing in the Ukraine right now is really just a spillover of, of the Arab Spring and the ideas that emerged there. Um, so all of this makes this kind of stuff, again, possible but difficult, um, and uh, the outcomes are not necessarily clear. Who benefits, who loses isn't particularly clear, um, and that's sort of the societal challenge in, in grappling with this. And that's what I've got. So thanks.